So we're talking about security and virtual desktops. Yay. No. <coughs> so I'm Jarian. I uh, you know, present a lot of places, EDE, like a couple times. I went to Dublin. That was fun. Stop buying tickets every time you're not coming. Hey, I'm a micro sponsor. We had this discussion. <laughs> micro sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, pretty much register for every event, whether I can make it or not, and he always yells at me for doing it, but it's I hope it's gonna work. Once I say there's a registration for this event, he registers. It never comes. It's like for the last five years, isn't it? Yeah, things change, you know. Between kind of like Claudio. Yeah, kind of like Claudio. Yeah. Oh, I thought you said Claudio. Sounds like you can let so somebody yeah, in there. Yeah. So, but, you know, Ryform, EDE, Synergy, user groups, I'm the leader, one of the leaders of Kansas City and uh, co host of the Frontline Chatter podcast. And I'm the new new guy. Definitely not as cool as Jarian. Um, but, uh, yeah, but oh, you're still with... cool, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Right there. yeah, it does. It does. That way, it's also in there, right? Um, so I've done lots of stuff all over the place um, and been doing lots of things. And I just became independent at the end of last year from a partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Eight and a half quarters of the year, almost nine years there. And so um, far. So far, I'm loving it. It's the best decision I made, especially for my family. For me, uh, I get to do stuff that I enjoy, which I think is the most important thing in life, anyway. So yeah, I think I'm we have this discussion about you going independent just before you went independent. So yep, yep, yeah. I even called them. Yeah. I was like, tweet them. I was like, dude, how was it? Because it's like pulling a bandaid off. Yeah. If you've been in the yeah. corporate world forever, uh, even as a partner, FTE c customer, <laughs> it's, it's pretty tough. And you know, you got two kids, and I was like, oh, it's going to be kind of risky. Uh, but I did watch a lot of Netflix for the first couple of weeks, so that was great. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so we're going to kind of go over some of these main topics of security stuff as it relates to Citrix because uh, Citrix by default is not very secure on next, next, next if you just kind of go with it, right? If you just go with default, so, you know, we'll kind of get into that. But, you know, since 2008 when VDI really got going and image maintenance, Ardent really had got to its pinnacle. Um, you know, the attack service has completely changed. Um, now, if you actually get in somewhere, it's completely soft. That's what, you know, micro segmentation is all about, east, west, and stuff like that. Um, but everyone has a very bad habit of not updating things, right? And it's sometimes it's a good habit because when you're dealing with LTSRs and stuff like that, as Alex is going to talk about, and Cerner and Epic and EMRs and PLMs <coughs> and Oracles and all that stuff, you have to stay on X version for it to even work and be supported. Sometimes a lot of that stuff is there. But that doesn't mean you can't patch though. So That's right. And we got a good session yesterday on how to seal and use the cool scripts to be able to make it easier so you can try to automate this. At least for security and Windows updates, right? Like just do that. Um, and this was, uh, this was something I did a while back, but I mean, just millions and millions of people's records, right? This is why you do not use a same password for multiple sites right here, because every place that you have it, that's your weakest link, right? Some random forum, some random thing gets popped, then you're done. Millions and millions of records keep getting out. Every big name you can imagine has had a breach, and you know, mm -hmm. Apple kind of started it in this kind of thing with GoToFail in 2014. Real, real quick though, yep. who here turns on multi-factor authentication where they can yep. on different sites? Yep. Yes. Good. Yeah, that's, that's smart nerds. So for <coughs> every website I visit, they get not just an individual passport, but they get an individual email address as well. Mm -hmm. So I can so I can tell where every single. Hmm. Uh, I can, so I can tell where, and I can block it if, if an email address is I don't know how then I can spam it, I can block that individual one. Yeah, with your own domain though. Yeah, yeah, just my own domain. Yeah, just pop a new email. I can also tell exactly who sold my information on to what company. <laughs> so so when I get a mail to dabcc at jimworld.com from Citrix. <laughs> <laughs> Does that happen? <laughs> I, I know what's happened, right? Yeah. And uh, I, just, I, just got, uh, I just got an email from massive holes, uh, virus laden email from passenger Wi-Fi at Jim Moldencom, which is the Virgin Trains Wi-Fi service which you pay to go. That's the only time I've ever given that email address out. Which, which goes back to like Ruben's point on ad blocking, <coughs> right? It's mm -hmm. part of it too, you know. But I, sp I spoke to them, I said, you've got a possibility of a data breach because nobody else in the has ever had this email address. I went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards with them. And eventually they just denied they had had a breach. But not before they put my email address into all of the breach sites, 
and I got emails saying your email has been entered into this site. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So just to kind of to reinforce what you were saying about the data breaches, I mean, one of the things I worry about the most is what you do not hear. So oh, yeah. we're in the tax and accounting market. There were well over 4 million fraudulent <laughs> tax returns filed last year on 1040 individuals. And your tax preparers, unless they're part of something big, like H&R Block or something like that, if they're breached, they probably don't know. Mm -hmm. And if they do, they are not aware or not following any regulatory compliance about notifying you. Right. So that happened to me. I got TurboTax got hacked. Like somebody filed a tax return to under it, my name, social security number, and everything. Yep. Yeah. Everybody has been hacked. So that uses two factor now. Yep. Right. And the two factor was just mandated by the IRS and what's the for us as an industry this last year, which um, people really love when they're busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they fake the numbers. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so wow. this was kind of a trend from 2014. Heart bleed. Uh, obviously, that was super fun for a couple people. Uh, I was involved with a, a forensics case for a place that actually got popped using it, so it was a pivot in there. But it's because Juniper didn't release a patch for months after Heart Bleed was released, and uh, that's how they pivoted to get in and do a golden ticket and do all kinds of fun stuff. But shell shock, you know, kind of there. Bad USB. Hence why, you know, be, be careful what you plug into USB because in many cases it can do anything it wants. Poodle, everyone started this, SSL V3, right? Hopefully everyone is at least B or A's for all your SSL goodies. Uh, just did an audit for a company and every single one was F's. Can you please not switch the, the slides so quick? I, I, I'm going to fall down now. Yeah. He likes the dogs. So ransomware and crypto locker. Um, and this is what is proliferated. Uh, I know a couple people that know some people that you know, we were talking about it at lunch that, you know, you can make a couple thousand dollars a day mm -hmm. sending emails. I mean, like literally no problem, no worry about it, multiple Bitcoin accounts, siphon them over, transfer, transfer to yourself. Uh, you transfer like about 16 times between Bitcoin accounts and then you're, no one's going to be able to track it out depending on how you exit out. So it's kind of a interesting process. And speaking of ransomware, Alex is going to love this. I've got a customer that was pretty much the Bit Defenders in server integration, they're a customer too, and they got ransomware like several times. And they went to the Zinsert, they actually were in server shop even though before the, the Bitdefender stuff came out, but they got the Bitdefender, the uh, introspect stuff, haven't had an issue since. Yeah. Yep. So there's a nice in server use case for you. All right. So, <laughs> so does it say that the not use Bitdefender? <coughs> it's not no, no, Bitdefender, okay. Bitdefender, oh, so Bitdefender, it, it, Bitdefender them it, it, intermingling Bitdefender across the board, they have not been hit since, no issues, nothing. But there's much better solution. Do not install Zen server. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Well, you don't need Windows. Yeah. That is your problem. Where's the, the root of all evil? So ransomware variant. Uh, we had a couple people uh, that obviously had a couple major problems. A couple big companies in my area in Nashville that I do work with actually shut off external email two Fridays ago uh, mm. to try to stop this. And it was because they had out of 120 to 150,000 computers, the biggest client, they had about 9,000 computers that didn't have that patch on it, right? Probably had SMB1 able to. Yep. <laughs> no, all top of it, yes. And, 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 and the problem is not only the installation of the patches, but the point that if, if your customers either have the control themselves, or conversely, the organization does not have the power to enforce that these machines get rebooted so that these, these fixes get yep. put into place. Yep. And that is a huge issue. For that big client, I mean, with with 150,000 devices and only 8,000 <coughs> didn't have it, that's a very low percentage, right? That's a low percentage that if you had 100 workstations and only eight of them didn't do it, it's not it's not crazy, it's not good, but you can't chase them all down, it right? You're gonna call 6,000 admins to find the 8,000 PCs, but it only takes one. The thing is that like WSS is free though yep. too, so there's no excuse for not having some kind That's of right. I mean, patching. patching. Yeah. Yeah. And then I using scripts to steal your images biggest. and crack them, that, that is the key point. for us yeah. as the yeah. Citrix guys, even with link clones with VMware View, you need to be cracking and putting these patches on there. They don't release them just for fun, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, it's almost all AVs would not catch this infection. So I thought it was very funny when all the security vendors were like, if you would have had Bitdefender, yeah. if you would have had Silence, if you would have had Bit9, you would have had all it wouldn't have mattered. It was a complete Windows vulnerability, right? I mean, it would have been nice, right? 
um, but it wasn't going to do anything. Extra hop is cool because you can at least catch some stuff. There's a ways to catch some of the keys, but and and the recovery of that is currently <coughs> do not shut down the computer and then yep. is it? restore. Restore is the most common <coughs> way, uh, and then there are a couple ways with this variant with blue eternal internal blue right here that you can actually get the one byte of data if it's still in memory, and that is the hash that you can go back and un decrypt your stuff. Mm -hmm. But it has to be at the, you have to get it like right at infection time, so. <coughs> All right, so, so essentially if you see that red message, there is no recovery from that. All right. No, no, you, or you, you pay mm -hmm. uh, or you restore. Yep. So. But, but when they say, I mean, I, I read the news the other day, and they said that there is a non, uh, there's not, uh, a single case known where people got recovered? Uh, I mean, when they paid? Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people do that. Because sometimes what will happen, if someone <coughs> pays within 15 minutes, a lot of these guys have hackers and uh, little bots. They pay within 15 minutes, they'll raise the price and not decrypt it. Yeah. Right? And then when they pay again, then usually they might let it go. It depends on whoever's running it, because there's so a command station <coughs> that all these go to. Uh, ran by whichever person or group or whatever, so they they decide the rules. So they never decrypt. Yeah, no. very yeah. often. You so pay, whatever people nothing. pay, they never they yep. never. Oh yeah, decrypt yep. every day, every day, That's every right. day, all day. Except no, but do they decrypt or not? <laughs> they do. They can. The person who runs the command station can decrypt. But do they actually ever did? Or ever some, did? some people do. It's, small, it's very smaller use cases than most of them. They're, they're going to raise the price or not decrypt. Man, this is why they get such a bad name. You pay them and they don't fix yeah. your stuff? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> look, look, I'm my my, my brother's company is very experienced. That's the thing. That's where you know, separated <laughs> all-site yeah, backups are insane. Wow. I know customers who've gotten this. And their backups got infected too. Well, they they yeah, actually not so. they yeah. encrypted <coughs> data that now they can't do anything with, right. and then it rolls off because it was just a partial SMB mm -hmm. encryption of a share because that's all they had access to. It goes days, weeks, months, and now backups have rolled off because everyone's like Commvault, and I've got seven days of synthetics and all this, and you lose the ability to even restore. So. This is a good point for Citrix and everybody, but your data is worth more than your product now, right? Leaks are gonna keep happening, geopolitical stuff. You know, I thought Colin Powell did a good job on some of that stuff. Nothing is sacred, if anything, it's more dangerous now. And since we're in an ever more connected world, it means your stuff is gonna get out there one way or another. So, this is probably the easiest, quickest thing you can do to help secure your deployment is don't be that person with unfiltered <laughs> policies. I cannot believe how many Fortune 500, 1,000 companies, and even 50 <coughs> companies that I've looked at their Citrix deployment, and I come in and look at that. Yep, you go into you know, assessment and you're like, oops. Uh, <laughs> someone didn't. If someone only was, was a so way to find out what all the default fine, right? settings were. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. And the funny thing is, like with, with the default settings, they've improved the protocol settings. But nothing security-wise <coughs> yep. either. It's so still mapping all the drives. Yep. Right. Uh, USB re redirection was at least turned off in the 7x world oh, as the default, oh. so that was good. But you're still mapping everything else, right? And uh, even you can still map a USB drive right, right. even with USB turned off because you can mount it and copy over and all that. So you can do that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> it's always insecure. To use those default policies. Um, so. This is probably the easiest. Disable all the client mappings. That's the quickest thing you can possibly do to at least stop exfil, right? Coming through there, by far. And then you can unfilter. Usually I set up, you know, three policies, right? Uh, and external, internal, and then the default, right? And then that way you unlock the things you expect to unlock, but you lock everything down with that default. Is there any tech vector through the clipboard? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely, because you can execute script through the clipboard. Mm -hmm. So that's where that bidirectionality is is important. When I, whenever I talk to customers, I say, you know, pick your three data channels: clipboard, printing, and drive mapping. Yep. If any one's open, you might as well open all three. Yep, yep. Because you can push any data through them. That's the thing. Or mm -hmm. well, in and or out, right? So that's why you don't want anyone to be able to paste out of your environment. But you also probably don't want anybody to it copy in, in too, yep. because then that's <laughs> how they get malicious code in there um, to start stuff. So this is you know Project VRC right here, right? I mean, the good thing about optimizations is it also hardens your device at the exact same time, right? You don't need 70 unused Windows services. Uh, and uh, 
turning them all off is definitely, and there's so many tools now that you can optimize that. Yeah, just, VMware has their, Synergy announced their system optimizer where it's more, did anyone see that from Synergy? Yes, in the, yes. In the booth, so they have their system optimizer where it's more than just uh, the VDI or Synapse sessions, it actually is it's gonna be cross product. So PBS server, right. storefront, that, that's the way it's gonna do and it's gonna be able to submit your own too as well. The one thing with optimizations though, you have to look at user experiences versus <coughs> security too right. so there's that fine line there because you turn off search you know as an optimization you can kill user experience pretty good yep. Mm -hmm. yep. outlook's not going to work yeah it depends on what you're publishing in there it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fine fine line for sure and he's uh, up and but you're up and he's down and he's down <laughs> and we're quick yep so app locker i know we even talked about that a little bit yesterday uh if anyone's not using it uh, you can do it. At least put it in audit mode. Yeah. You would be amazed of what you're going to find in any deployment just doing that one policy. Not even the 20 clicks it takes <coughs> to actually configure it, depending on how many EXEs you have. I mean, it is not anything crazy. Um, and if you can get to a whitelist, that is the golden, right? Uh, if you're able to just prevent execution. Now, if you have Empire <coughs> Solution X, Y, and Z, <coughs> you might not even need an app blocker at all. But it would be nice though for like these, these vendors, you know, VMware, Citrix, whatever, to release some kind of integration with app blocker, or even, you know, to help you kind of get that base out of there, see that you have these applications in your image, or, yep. you know, app DNA scans it, and say, okay, well, let's build these app blocker policies. If you think about when you, when you would go and create a delivery group, and you go add, and it auto enumerates all the things that are installed that you could publish yeah. if it used that to say are these all good for whitelisting. Yeah, because right? the BDA can enumerate all the applications that you right. publish it, so why not say, okay, let's let's create an app locker type configuration out of that enumeration. Yep. <clears throat> so app locker goals, yeah, I think everybody we can kind of skip through this. I think everyone here knows app locker and it's not it's not complicated. There's the that's the setting that takes one minute. Just turn on an auto button. So three clicks, the checkbox, those drop down boxes are audit only to begin with, then hit OK. Right? So one policy is all it takes to at least start, right? Do you have a performance it by doing that? The what? Do you have a performance it? You do have a little performance it. Um, it's sometimes I've seen a, a server that would hold 100 go down to like 99. Right. Yeah, it's like so, a it's like a less than five percent hit. Yeah. So, so it's not it's not huge. It's, it's not Office twenty thirteen to twenty ten and all that stuff. Well, we're talking event viewer. You're talking local event viewer, right? So if you're not redirecting that somewhere else and you're using a non persistent and you're not redirecting that to your D drive or whatever, then you've got a problem there too. Yep. Yeah. So that's where you use things like the event yeah, collections see. pieces, mm -hmm. or yep. even a PBS world redirect that to the the right cache driver to a static driver. Right. Well, yeah. 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 This will just get past all that. That's just there. Um, Windows firewall. We turned it off. Everyone. <laughs> Everybody, come on. No, no, I keep it on. Yeah. Internal as well. So the good thing is, is Citrix in the 7X releases obviously put, puts exclusions in for you when you install certain roles like the DDC and PBS, stuff like that. So the thing is, is just if you just turn it on, you could just live by those, right? The one thing that's annoying is because that's why we don't do it, but Make you know, leave RDP or PS remoting or whatever your policy is on PS remoting. There's lots of people that are like yeah. anti PS remoting, uh, and there's good reasons for it, right? Especially if you're gonna let anything not signed execute, right? Well, I think that's where the, the SSH, the Win Open, whatever it's called, SSH project, once that comes more into um, fruition, I think that's gonna help this as well because you'll be able to use certs and that kind of stuff yep. and use SSH instead of WS man and PS remote, so. Yeah, it's gonna be good. And then IPsec. There's lots of cool ways you can implement this that aren't very complicated depending on what your CA infrastructure is. I've done this for a couple of deployments um, and probably the most important thing about a CA is that bullet right there. There's lots of people that have presented on this. Once you've made your root ser ser server powered off, um, because no one ever needs that private key again once all the other domain controllers have been rolled. Having access to that private key is the most dangerous thing possible. The more things you use to sign it with, the more valuable that private key is. And then every three to five years, or whatever expirations you set, you power it back on and you renew it. That's like right. having the plan with the Death Star. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and that's how R2D, R2D2's got them, right? Yeah, in one use case too, it's like this is where you also look at micro-segmentation products too as well. Um, I had a customer like years ago before the segmentation was a thing that they actually used the Juniper Odyssey client in their virtual desktop stuff. 
they treated everyone as basically untrusted. So everyone came through a gateway, and then in their session, they had the Odyssey client, and based on their credentials, what they're allowed to talk to in and out from that machine. So there, there's ways with, you know, equal format or segmentation, you could lock things down and make sure that only certain traffic based on that user can get from point A to point B and so forth. Yep. And then good old workspace yes. environment management. Yeah, the main thing here is that this should probably, for Citrix going forward, kind of be the management of that world. You know, the policies, the profile management. There is some whitelisting and blacklisting of processes in there. But instead of looking at, do I do policy here or policy there, I, I think going forward, this should kind of be the management plane for all that. Does anyone agree, disagree? Nice. Yeah. No. So are, console. are they uh, planning on uh, introducing any web tools to capture information? I mean, to scan a machine and pull the EXEs in, things like that, um, or to you know export out of uh, group pol your group policy preferences into WEM, something that takes from a manual step to something that's not? Because, I mean, I'm looking at probably, you know, at least 150 objects I'm going to have to move over from one thing, you know, group policy or wherever else into yeah. WEM to, to make that, it possible. That's actually yeah. a, a good feedback point for a future um, <coughs> request, but, you know, there's some reg keys you can bring in. Not all types of reg keys you can bring. I think the binary has issues, if that's what I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah you um, can't bring everything in. Yeah, but um, you're absolutely correct. There needs to be some kind of migration tool there, for There's that. weird stuff, too, with, like, drive mappings. If you're trying to add, like, a, an admin share in, it won't map it. You map it with group policy, mm -hmm. which... Yeah, because it, this kind of rides pretty much on group policy preferences, mm. but then makes it more <coughs> contextual at, at action um, than just regular group policy preferences. Plus, it um, helps you, you know, like I said, the contextual piece and not make sure everything's getting that log on, but mm. when you're doing certain things. So, but yeah, that's a good point about the uh, being able to export import. Yeah, and that, th that's something like we can we can send back as a feature request. Yeah, I, I talked to a couple people and asked for that. So, you know, synergy. So. It might be in 2019. Yeah. <laughs> but the biggest thing, if you're enterprise or higher, you should be using that and start looking at migrating to that going forward. They'll announce the change next year? Right. But they won't deliver it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it'll be V1 then, so you can't use it because yeah. it won't work. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So you have to wait till 2020. Uh, so networking, uh, you know, VLANing things just for security. Um, and you have some money for NSX, obviously, the way to go. You don't need it for PBS segregation as much anymore, right? I know there's been lots of stuff with Nick and a lot of guys out there blogging about it. Um, but for security, VLANs are still there, even if you're a full ACI shop and you've got VXLANs and trunking all the stuff with VMM and all that, right? You're still going to separate stuff that way. Um, and e east and west is the you know the new way that See, everything's going to go, go back to that. So it would be nice, you know, with Citrix, your Zinsa were play here. They have, well, they have that EBS, right? It'd be nice if they build upon that more to help with some of this in a, in a desktop or just even server environment. You have Cisco doing their stuff with ACI. VMware's got their stuff. Um, even Hyper-V, you can use Nutanix their stuff as well. Have stuff yeah, too. Nutanix right. is going to have stuff as well. That's so it'd be nice to see them take that DDS, you know, and the APIs that have it and build on top of that to integrate that more with in, inside their product. Because they're saying they're a security company now, so let, you know, let's, let's see some of that. Yeah, let's show it. Yeah, so there, I mean, a lot of people that I've done dealt with that did trend, you already have to deploy NSX, so you're at least halfway there. All you got to do is a couple things. Getting ARCN slash Network Insight going is probably the most important thing. So if, depending on if, how big your shops are that you work with and consult with, you can get somewhere to come in. They're going to go crazy for themselves to get a chance to install it and show the management consoles mm -hmm. here so that you can start learning your firewall rules and applying it. The, law, the import rules from Network Insight to NSX are not very beautiful right now. It's not just like confirm these firewall rules, it's actually exporting it and then truly importing it, um, which is good. But you can easily set up all the rules here between all your connection servers, if it's VMware, security servers, UAG, all that stuff, um, <clears throat> the quickest, right? And you're going to leave it any, any at the bottom and then you're just going to keep working on it until there's less and less hits of the any any and then you can eventually do your any deny right and that way you just head them off at the pass and only allowed traffic is allowed so dns sec um, <laughs> this is annoying this is why no one ever does it too this is another thing that uh you know with spoofing and being able to do that it's not hard at all um, a lot of people go to blue cats and things like that to get around this but in many cases, they follow some of the same RFC rules, which means you can still do the same thing to it, right? So <clears throat> you, you want to go beyond that. Uh, and we know how important DNS is with XDPing, right? If we're trying to register a desktop. So 
it's there. This is probably the thing that me and the drawing went over a bunch is just SSLing, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you you should do it. It is annoying, but <coughs> if you're a consultant, it's more time, right? More time is money, right? <laughs> we got that laugh back there. <laughs> well, the nice thing, too, is that even with, on the Citrix side, they come out with more guides, more information on how to make sure that you're using SSL everywhere. Yep. You know, it's not there by default, but you have the option to, to do it, and if you can do it, do it. Yep. That's pretty much, pretty much the point here. Yep. And there's lots of places yep. that you can do it for free. If you can do, especially in your lab, so you can play and see how Storefront and XML and STAs and all those things work over SSL, because they're kind of have their special moments, all of them, but you can get past it, right? It's not, it's not insurmountable. Yeah, go back real quick. The one thing with, with Flipped Encrypt, yeah, it can be a pain because it's 90 days, you have to renew it. Yeah. Um, but as long as you start using some of these tools, like the CertBot or even some of the clients they have out there, <coughs> there's even a PowerShell client that you can use to automate some of this stuff. So like in your yeah. labs, if you don't have access to like free SSL stuff, Flipped Encrypt's a good option. Now you can't do wild cards, you can't do certain things with it, but for general SSL, you have access to it. I, I was just curious uh, how many people, just for the, the intranet connectivity among servers, just generate their own SSL certificates. Yeah, I have some, they have like right. ADCA stuff, they'll use that. And make because, sure. I mean, yep. you could say, I want 20 years worth, you know, and, yep. you know, set it and forget it. Yep. Or from like an outside facing, yeah. you know, yeah. public stuff. Yep. Yeah, your internal traffic is definitely the easiest to do, right? Even with or without a CA. You can, definitely, you, can, you can get it done. And then we talked about the SSL checking on the Netscaler. So Joe Schonk wrote this in Octoblue to where they go out there and periodically schedule, you'll check the, the SSL lab stuff and be able to tell you what your score is or periodic basis. And I know with Netscaler, they're getting better with secure by default, but out of the box, it's still yeah. not 100%. Right. And if you've, been, if you've been running on Netscaler since like 9x days and been just in place upgrading, those more secure ciphers. defaults yeah. are not turned on and off, vice versa, yeah. right? So it, it's going to not break your stuff or try not to, right? So you're going to keep upgrading. You're at 11. Now you're at 12. Well, you still have RC4. You still yeah. have weak defi. You still have SSLv3 turned on, right? It's not going to uncheck those things for you, right? If you install a brand new Netscaler, those things are all turned off and all ready to go. And that's where those periodic checks will help you, you know, identify what you need to fix yeah. and tell you exactly what's going on. So. App firewall. Does anybody actually use it here? Hell yeah. Yeah. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's something that I specialize in and do a couple big deployments with, and it it is the way to help fix so many things because. It only takes one little piece of code to actually <laughs> change the price. The formation will fall, and it only takes one. And there's been a couple SOAP interfaces and stuff like that between B2B connections that I've helped do, and you would be amazed that if they wouldn't have done it, what they would have happened. I've watched all kinds of SOAP queries from all kinds of countries and just get dropped, right? And there's rate, rate throttling and denial service and all the things that you can do there. So. It's a very important thing to do. In the Citrix world, I mean, of course we're talking about, yes, it's all layer seven, it's all the application. But for the Citrix world, we're really just worried about the storefront, right? I mean, you, that, that is our thing, but it's also the Netscaler gateway. So if you didn't know, that's the three ways that you're able to do it, right? You got positive, this is only what good behavior is, that's bad behavior, hybrid is a little bit of learning on top of it, right? Well, the worst part about App Firewall is convincing the developers to code well not to put SQL injections and shit like that in the code. <laughs> yeah, no, the doing that. Uh, there's been a couple banking apps and forms that I've had to do that had hundreds of fields and it is absolutely a bear because you, it's like, what is the what do you want to be put in there? And they've got like blob turned on. Mm -hmm. So you could put anything in this and it becomes a very kind of a more difficult Netscaler WAF deployment. But those learn that learning stuff Sure opens their eyes though. Yes. yes. When you show yes. them that, so. yes, indeed. Because they never know what their application is really doing in some cases, right? <laughs> Which it's just like many of us, we've, we've copied and pasted PowerShell scripts and we just run it on the trust of each one. And if you actually looked at the PIDs and saw what it's doing, you're like, holy crap, this is this is insane. So that's. So they're talking about your scripts? <laughs> <laughs> so storefronts there, um, it's not a huge attack surface, but it's IAS, right? And we know how good IAS is, right? So that is what it is there. Um, 
I've had a lot of people that their net scalers once WAF has been deployed in Citrix deployments, the security team just takes over, right? They want their own logins, they want to own the box, the network team gives it up, the Citrix team gives it up, um, just because there's so much power, but you have to pay to play, right? You yep. have to have Platinum Edition, so it's, it's not everyone. Smart access control, this is another very simple thing, even in that default unfiltered policy, is you know the IPs and subnets of your facilities, use that to your ability, you know, uh, head them off in the past. Now, can I still change my client IP address to 10.1.something and then log in and be client IP address? Yes, of course I can, but I have to know what that is, so at least make it a little harder for me when I'm doing a pen test, right? It's like an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Admin rights. Everybody's got them, nobody wants them, <laughs> but they're the bane of all existence. Oh, is there? What do you think of the new JEI stuff? JEA stuff. Sorry. Just enough administration. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm still looking into that. Um, with you know, my thing a lot of customers right now, they're requiring admins to have separate logins. Yep. So when they do stuff, they usually have to go into some kind of system and get their admin password, and that way they're just not by default admin rights. The other thing I'm trying to get customers to do is yep. use this solution from Microsoft as well <coughs> um, to basically control your local admin passwords and that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 So if you're not using this, this is free out there to download. Yeah. And it's fairly easy to use. The JEA stuff is still, you know, something that, yeah, it, it's still a little bit difficult for some and it's it's still a little newer, but it's something that should be looked at as well. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for all of our Windows uh, admin logins now, we have to use um, a YubiKey and <coughs> yep. Duo. <laughs> And yeah. it's it's kind of a pain, but it's that's, what you have to do. That's what you got to do if you really want to have a secure yep. environment. Yeah, the <coughs> customers I go into where they have um, a, uh, a model where you don't know your admin password, it changes like every couple of days. Yep. Um, and you have to log into the system using some kind of MFA to even get to that, and it's tracked and audited and that kind of stuff too. So I've, I've seen, seen that more and more in other places as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. You know what I should and I should add by the way, we have no passwords. There are none. That's the only way you can get a um, Webster. Here's a question. You Speak. left out one. What? 2016's privileged access. Um, Post account management, Pam. Or is that later? We got some of the 2016 yeah. stuff in there. Okay. Yeah. Because Pam is uh, something that uh, is very useful. I haven't had a chance <laughs> to play with it yet. Neither, neither have I. So. It looks kind of complex to set up, but for a lot of places, that really will <clears> help. Uh, because if someone wants or needs domain admin rights, they can request it for a specific period of time. Yep. You have a separate bastion force that's handling all that. So if Tobias needs domain admin rights from 1 to 1.30, mm -hmm. if it's approved at 1 p.m., he gets a domain admin rights at 1.30 and 1 second. He's They're done. gone. Yep. <laughs> If Tobias lives long enough to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's been three, three or four jabs for that thousand every single day. So does anyone use the main service accounts in Windows as well? Yeah, but most software does not. Well, let you use it. Yes. Well, it, let you use it. I, this works with PBS. I thought they have PBS and it works there. I don't know if it's 100% yeah. support yet. I know we had that conversation before. It's about it, Windows services yeah, that are right. running it, really. Right. right. PVS, um, I can't remember what. I remember it, <coughs> something in the least of the one edition, but I don't think it's 100% supported still, right? I know it's there though. Uh, it actually, well, you can actually set up your, um, in the configuration wizard, you can actually enter a uh, you know, managed service. That, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. But I can't remember what version that became available in. Um, it, I think it's, but I don't know if Citrix actually yeah, that's what it supports was. it. Yeah. it. It works. It was like a seven X version, um, like a later seven X version. Yeah, because uh, uh, Tom, Tom, yeah, uh, asked get, me about that. Yeah, that's why I haven't retested it. So he did, and it worked. Yeah, so this still works. There's a, there's a free tool out there to help you kind of, to, like a weak tool to help you set it up and manage it too. Uh, there's a, <coughs> uh, yeah, a link in the, the slide notes, but another thing you can use is looking at using managed service account. So. That's another one. Um, antivirus. Yeah. This this is back to the Project VRC back in 2013 that probably scared most people and continually uh, scares people to not put it on there because <coughs> of how much overhead it is. Um, and some places, some some vendors, it just doesn't work. And it's pretty much anything that uses DAT files. The longer it takes you to crack your image for normal maintenance, the worse the penalties are. Symantec may make you download every single incremented DAT, which could be 
four, five hundred megs per virtual desktop times five thousand desktops every boot, every <coughs> reboot, right? So you can get into very bad situations with many AB companies if you're not updating regularly, uh, or if you don't even have it configured, it might not <coughs> work at all. Right? But also, like know your your exclusions for the different products out there. We also are including that now, um, knowing some of the things about when to scan, when not to scan. Yep. That, those type of things. Um, also, some of those third-party products that where you have the average integration. Um, anyone have success with those? Say that again. The third-party um, hypervisor integration products, yeah, yeah. where it's kind of offloads from the crime, like Trend has it, and yep. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and McAfee, McAfee, yeah. I haven't been the, had the best success yeah, we with. McAfee Wolf, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, Trend has been pretty good. But then so, you have Trend to use not Zen server. server. Yeah, that's right. The Bitdefender stuff's pretty good too. Okay. Bitdefender so, and Zen server does work. Yeah, yeah. that does work, Alex. Touche. Introspection and just definition updates being managed in the Right. So in here, um, these are all the kind of the big players. Um, I've had good luck with Silence. I've had good luck with Bitdefender. Um, Symantec is Symantec. Trend Micro is probably the best guest introspection that works, um, but in some cases. Uh, paying to play NSX, the integration, uh, especially since they've changed vShield Manager, can become very annoying. And then when you are tied to ESX version on your virtual desktops or your server based computing, it becomes very annoying to <coughs> upgrade to ESX <coughs> from that point forward. One point that is super important if you're using like McAfee Move or any agent license virus on VMware, you have to update your VMware keys. Yes. I've seen a lot of people exactly. like doing it. and. You know, you have to check also if it's compatible with the new agent. Yeah. Because and, uh, you, and it all has an issue out there where your CPU will go to 100 percent and performance yep. will be shifted pretty much here if you don't have to that. Yeah, I have some harsh discussions with anybody who thinks Trend Micro is doing a good job these days. Um, they are probably my least favorite vendor uh, okay. at this point. So well, you, they're a spider <laughs> web that you install in your ESX deployment right, of how it interconnects and all the dependencies that it mm -hmm. has. It's, it's a very complicated well, system. Well, I, I would live with that if I thought it worked, but it doesn't. Yeah. Well, I almost, mean, I, there's not any of these that block attacks that walk right, right. through it yeah. on a daily basis. Well, no. even that Symantec, a year old. VP got up on stage and said, <clears throat> we block less than 30% of all attacks on the stage of his own conference. Yeah. A lot of these, some of those probably, and, like, but, but then Silence will say, I block 100% of everything. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it depends who you talk to, though. The, yeah. the product marketing guys say they'll block yeah. everything you well, need. That's what says in the airport, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> right beside Barracuda. But right? you get to the product manager, and you're like, in, in, in my role, I'm like interviewing him. I'm like, I'm quoting you on whatever you say next. Do I need antivirus if I also have Silence? And he's like, yeah, it's probably best if you have something yeah. else, too. Yeah, so so. A lot of these have the app whitelisting and blacklisting built into them. So that can be beneficial. If you've already deployed one of these, there's no need to do app locker, right? Um, because you might, it might be actually better. Uh, and then you have application manager still out there, Eventco, if you've ever done that. So this is locking it down further. There's a couple other vendors in this space. Those are probably the big two. But yeah. a lot of the next gens have all the options that you could ever need to do application blocking and whitelisting. What do you guys feel about Bromium? Uh, Bromium. Yeah, that, that, that's a cool one too as well. And some of the other products too that will stack multiple engines, yep. so they have a better chance of catching something. Yep. Um, those, those ones are like those too. Like, um, who's that company that the the Netscaler does the integration with now for the EPA? Um, oh, uh, oh right. Zscaler. The, no, that's for it's, on the Zscaler. SD1. No, the one that you where you do the custom EPA stuff. Um, the it's a third party company, um, but that product allows you to stack multiple AV <laughs> engines. Other uh, company does. Defense um, layers. What's that? Defense and layers. Yeah. Yes. And then you got server uh, 2016 oral not supported yet, but that actually changed because as of 714, well 712 Citrus Body and Secure Boot support, um, and then 714, which really wasn't advertised as much, but it works. I'll show you a demo here next. Um, you can do a device guard and credential guard now in 714, and so um, you know start using that thing. The one thing about device guard and credential guard, it does still require it to be a virtual machine. Um, from Hyper V, so that's where you're seeing like ESX Zen Server now supporting the the nested virtualization, and that's going to put some overhead <coughs> into your environment. To mileage will vary. Yeah, mileage to be determined. And to be right. determined. There's some newer um, process. There's a special processor version coming out. They'll have that built in to help offload some of that, but it's still going to have some some issues by going this route. Right. So if you're Hyper V though, you're not going to have that overhead. But if you're Zen Server, if you're uh, vSphere, you're going to get even HV. 
you're going to have some issues um, overhead with this because you're basically doing that double hop. And then trying to troubleshoot that's going to be fun. So um, I got this from Kurt Moody because um, I've been pinging Citrix about um, the support for this for a while. <coughs> um, so here's a demo of Credential Guard support, and this is a Zen app. Um, so what you can do is you launch the desktop. Um, he's going to go in and check out his credentials in here, see what's turned on. So go to command line. We're going to use um, our first MS info to see. So you see the device guard's running. Um, and it's secure boot. Yep, it's secure boot's on. But we don't have credential guard on and yet. And all the other yep. fun little things <coughs> are all turned on. Yep. And so we're going to go in and change the policy here in a second. So you see these bottom ones aren't enabled. And then go on and turn a policy on. Oh, first it's going to show you that this is where you can see where a patch, the hash attack can happen because of the Mimi shots. Yep. Because the credential guard is not fully enabled yet. It says to go in here and look at it. And we'll zoom in here and you'll see. So. Yeah, it slows down. Yeah, it slows right down. There. So, right here, you'll see the user, all the info, the SID, and then you'll see that, you know, the hash may be used by a bad actor to do pass the hash. Style <coughs> that. If the session gets compromised. And then we'll go ahead and turn some things on. And most of this is all done through your policy. The main thing for Citrix was getting secure boot um, enabled in 7.12. And so now in 7.14, this is fully supported. So I go into group policy here. <coughs> Going to go ahead and enable it. So there's secure boot. And then now we're going to turn credential guard on. And so now we're going to come in and do a new session. Once the pause is applied, <coughs> we're going to run the same EV cat, check the credentials. Or actually, give info first. Now it's on. Now it's on. So you see credential guards there now, where it wasn't before. <coughs> and now we're going to go back to the command line and do EV cats again. Yep. If anyone watches Mr. Robot, at least they use the correct tools there. <laughs> He's going to be cats like two times on there. So I go back and look at the credentials again. <coughs> and you can see the encryption that will be in there. Bigger blob. Yep, bigger blobs. That way, you know, from that past the hashtag. It's, it's not no NTLM. So now it's available in 7.14 out of the box. He's going to have a blog out here um, pretty soon as well uh, about this, um, go over some more information and so forth, but that's a new security feature we have now in 7.14. Which again, I'm surprised it really wasn't talked about at all. That's, that's been a great demo to show mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. keynote as, you know, the security <coughs> feature. Yeah, but, but it would actually uh, use Mimi Cats on the keynote stage. And this, this actually wasn't even in the expo floor either. This was something I've been pinging him about since he wrote those blogs in Hyper-V in 2016 and that kind of stuff. And he goes, hey, I want to show you something. And he's like, you can use this, you know, for your guys' session you're doing, so. Is that Hyper-V only? So yeah, it's Hyper-V only. So what you're going to have is basically you're going to have nested virtualization for this. So if you're running <laughs> Hyper-V, you're, you're not going to have that hit. But if you're running Zen Server, ESX, AHV, it's going to be basically nested virtualization. And so there is going to be a hit. Now there's some a special processor line coming out to help offload some of this, but you're still going to have some overhead with it. So, but, I mean, it's not the full Hyper V. Right? Cor correct, but right. using the virtualization, yeah, yeah piece yeah. of it. So just to get the memory separation. Yeah, this is kind of the punch list I do on remediation when I do security assessments on Citrix deployments. Is three policies is probably normal, <laughs> right? You got unfiltered, the, the lockdown, the internal yeah. internal unlock, and the external unlock. Do your SSL, not very complicated to do. Image optimizations, that is the best thing you can do 
to help prevent attacks. Turn off stuff that doesn't need to be there. For the SSL, uh, you know, everybody knows, I guess, IS Crypto. Yep. Um, there, I found there's an ABMX tool available on GitHub with all those settings. Yep. So, you know, that makes it that much easier. Just oh, nice. Yep. You know what the ABMX tool? Yep. That's good to know. So, it, these are probably your top three. Mm -hmm. uh, and then App Locker and or whatever you're going to do to, to block yeah, it. To to whitelist, white whitelist and blacklist, right? Uh, and then everything else, it, you know, of course, Windows Firewall could be cool and IPsec could be cool, but depending on your deployment, it could be very complicated to deploy and it could be a huge political thing. You might not want to go down the security team rabbit hole and the attack surface there. Preventing bad applications from running and tuning your image is going to give you the most bang for your buck with good policies, right? And have blockers. Yeah. It, well, yeah. yeah. So I, I I use host files on all mine. I don't I don't subscribe to installing the plugins. So I, I'm gonna send some emails and run some tests because that's how I've always done it with MVP host. Right, it gets updated basically monthly. Yes, is kind of annoying, um, but it has no overhead. Right, it just it just 127s whatever <coughs> that is, and it never displays it. Is um anyone starting to also see their where they're treating users even though they're corporate devices as still. Untrusted? Is anyone starting to see that? Yeah. I'm starting to see that grow too, as well. Where even if their corporate devices are coming in on, they're still having to go through the NetScaler gateway. Still an MFA. Still yeah, still MFA. Yep. That kind even of stuff. Even internal. <coughs> yep. That's the way you got to do it. Yeah. I mean, you truly do. Um, so conclusion. There's. Yep. Go. Look back. So, <laughs> uh, as a consultant, are those your right. estimated statement of work hours? Yep. So, those so are pretty much my kind of application right. firewall. It's actually 32 hours per application. That's First usually, one. yep, That's especially for testing, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, I'm not a person, so, so I'm if, if you use that formula and you said you went after a 10 app deal, right, you're going to end up with 320 hours, right? Mm -hmm. One application is going to take you three, another application is going to take you 200, right? Yeah. So, you use that, that is your safety net, yeah. right, when you're scoping it, right? That okay. 16 hours per app <laughs> is good. And you need just as much to implement it as you do test it, right? It has to be a balance. You can't do eight on the back end because testing is when you're going to find out there's problems and you yeah, have to make yeah. corrections, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to, you got to add fluff. And that has been a good fluff for the past like eight years that I've not got burned on. Yeah, better, right. to, better to, to come in under than have to rebid over. Yep. Yeah, you don't want to go back and uh, yeah. ask for all that. So there's lots of things you can do that are very easy. They're cheap, they're free, they don't take that long. You should definitely do them. There's no reason not to, right? Um, there's lots of products, but some cases it's not gonna give you the security you may need, right? Even just the free tools can provide some great yep. things, right? Especially with like Microsoft and ESET and yep. things like that that you can go on top of an AV solution. Um, AV, you need to run it, right? It might slow down, you need to tune it, you need yeah, to have something to yeah. prevent something. Uh, and I'll be working with Jarian. We'll be making a document <clears throat> that will kind of go through some of these punch lists and hardening guides and stuff like that in the future. Um, and you don't need to be a Lone Ranger. There's lots of people out there that are know all kinds of good things. And your security team might actually be excited if you in said, hey, can you help me do this? Um, because many of them probably are just sitting around looking at logs all day. They might be excited to do some SSL keys or something, right? Um, so don't do that. Security is not going to be easier, right? It's going to continually get worse. It's going to be the top of mind. It's going to be what everyone talks about. And if you're in the consulting world, that's what you need to lead your assessments with. You need to I'm assessing not for performance, but for security, and then performance will come with security, well, it's right? Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, you can't just you can't forget it, right? And then one thing too, also, if you're seeing more MFA one internally, like one thing I, I did for a customer who who required MFA internally for certain applications, but so basically use a use a, a lower end Netscaler VPX or VPX Express just for off only and still have all traffic go direct to storefront, but the off point is the Netscaler because storefront out of the box can't handle MFA. So that's one thing too as well. Um, yep. If you're starting to require certain certain environments get access the multi-factor authentication and then using like the filtering and the hiding or the, um, the smart access piece um, to hide those applications on non-multi-factor authentication um, access points and storefront. Yeah. 
this is another kind of simple way to look at the punch list of what I kind of go through there with policy and image optimization being the top two, right? You get those top two I was raised your computer. It's going to be good stuff. Uh, 2017, the Citrix Analytics, obviously, I think we all talked about that yesterday. Uh, CTP, no more inside scoop than uh, everyone else, but uh, for me, I want to see it actually do it because seeing this kill chain uh, and how it's going to work as someone does EPA and as it kills sessions, they come back, they fail MFA, be able to take tasks. I mean, this is like OctaBlue kind of heaven kind of Or knowing that I'm, I logged in here and then five minutes later I logged in for Super camera, effect, <laughs> something right? going on. So, yep. so CTPs and NDAs aside, <laughs> right hand up if you think we're going to see a real product this year, left hand if not. But this year, that's the trick. Mm -hmm. This year? What if, I don't know, what if maybe? A definite maybe. You, you said you knew more, so I was yeah. just curious. Yeah. Oh, he said we no, knew more. Said, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah that was my mouth. That was my mouth. I would hope that they would tell you guys something I mean, this, on this the huge product. This is stuff if they're serious. We hope so, too. So, yeah. Yeah. Take, take, take it like I this. I would hope that, too. Last, last year's, I guess what I'm really saying, Jerry, is when I listened, mm -hmm. I said, that's bullshit. They came up with this three weeks ago. So, take <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sorry, take it, Stephanie, take it from this it, standpoint, though. So, Kirill last year in the keynote said, we're going to do these things. This year he came out in the keynote and said, we delivered all these things we said last year. So I would expect it by next energy to have something. Yeah. Okay. Given yeah. that his, him being the CEO and him yeah. doing his first one, deliver what he said last year, hopefully it'll be the same thing next year. Yep. That, that, that's my thought. So. Yep. This is, a, this is a fun thing. If you're doing any assessments for anybody's anything, uh, always go look for the KRBG TDT user, right? Uh, because when you created your domain, um, it's that's when the password was set. So you can be cracking that password since 2012. Uh, I've been in places where it was 1987. I've been in where places where it was 1993, right? So it can be 10, 20 years old. And that password, depending on if someone's persistent, now obviously, hopefully they probably have already done whatever they're going to done and they're not trying over and over again. But this is this is a Mimi Cat's just Pandora's box Go right back. here um, because the password number changes. Go back, I just want to see that. Yeah. yeah, so if you look at this guy right here on the gold, <coughs> that'll tell you all about <coughs> that attack. And it uses the Mimi Cat's technique, so. And once you got it, good, all right. So then this is probably the main thing. Yep. So yeah, this, this, will, this will go to assist. You know, it doesn't make you a hacker, right? Uh, domain admins. This is what we kind of talked about, and reducing that. Yeah. Use delegated admins. I mean, this is an AD group. This is the easiest thing we can do. Uh, I've finished up a couple assessments before because they had a lot of stuff published to domain admins, and when I actually looked at it, it was mail. And then I actually look at use of it. They were actually launching mail with the domain admin account and then delegating to their normal account to read it. So that means if anything they executed would be able to just party on Wayne, party on Garth over their whole domain, right? Uh, so you don't want to do that. I mean, it's not, you don't need, even, even in some of the biggest organizations I've done stuff with, two to four, six to eight, some kind of parity, you know, HA, multiple time zones, that's fine but you don't need a million domain admins, and lots of accounts don't need to be domain admin. You know, go through delegated yeah. administration, lock those things down. Again, for your day-to-day stuff, you have them at the top, use a separate account, only use the admin account when you need those privileges. Yes. Back on the uh, Kerberos ticket granting ticket account, yep. uh, by default, that account's disabled, and a lot of people, it happens so frequently that people say, oh, this is a disabled account, I don't need it, and they delete it. Yeah. And then their AD goes burn. Then their AD goes greater. Yes. Microsoft actually has a KB article on what you have to do to pull it out of stones yeah. and all that. Yeah. The fun <clears> stuff. <throat> yeah. So our next goal is trying to go to some of the default policies between Citrix and VMware and Microsoft of which one is the most secure by default. Like if you just next, 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 which one has the most prevention of DLP kind of things, exfiltration out, um, they go from there. Windows Firewall, I've got most of those written, um, and so that that's one of the blog posts we were just talking yeah. about, how, how I can post easier, because it's so annoying when you've got WordPress and you've got pictures and they're pretty and you want to make it keep it pretty, it just doesn't work that way. Sure, so on the SmackDown, you're going to be doing Verizon versus Zenepers and Desktop, right? Mm -hmm. Are you also going to be looking at the hypervisor security from the Zen server versus we, vSphere? We will a little bit, I will eventually, but 
for me, it's those solutions just out of the box, right? If you just next, <coughs> next even RDS, right? Yep. Um, so because there's a lot of SSL things that one does and the other one's done. Yeah, there'll be some hyperware stuff in it, but later on that'll that'll that grow. Yep. So I have these two things. I have a huge <coughs> repository on that computer and share file of the security notes that I use when I do penetration tests in yep. Citrus deployments to correlate what CVS and CVE and all the attacks that you can do from being on 6.5 hotfix rollup 03, hotfix rollup 05, and trying to get that public so people can use it. It'll just be, it probably will not look pretty, it'll just be a table with all the versions and all the attacks. So if you do an assessment and it's version 6.5 and it's hotfix rollup 05, you can just copy and paste all the security things that are going to be wrong. That could be a good GitHub thing to be able to contribute to it. Yeah, I need to pick the correct one, right? The yeah. middle one, <coughs> middle, middle, <laughs> left, Apache. Yeah, go ahead. So do you have any suggestions for when you do an assessment on delegating accounts and things like that? One of the biggest problems we had with limiting domain accounts is people don't know what they're going to need to do. And so attempting to define yep. job roles and what kind of access yep. is needed. <laughs> Exchange person. admins are really, and, and CA admins are the only hard ones. Yeah. Exchange admins needing enterprise admin for certain things, but in many cases that's only upgrades. That's not administration, right? And that's only when you're moving between forests and domains and all that good stuff, right? So a lot of stuff you don't need it all the time. Um, but those are the, the toughest two. Uh, and then of course it's just a regular Active Directory identity engineer architect. They think that they need to be able to go to AdC Edit anytime they want to just go play around in there. Huge deployments do anything they can to not be able to get anyone into there. So. Uh, those are the two <laughs> toughest that I've seen. C C C C Citrix C C. A lot of these just. Why are you throwing down back there? No, you saying he agrees. Oh, okay. Yeah, I agree. I agree because it's, you know, well, people send uh, when I do AD assessments. Mm -hmm. it, it's just like you know there'll be five people mm -hmm. in IT and eighty-five people are domain admins and yes, you know, sixty people are enterprise admins and of you know, yep. and service accounts or schema admins, enterprise uh -huh. admins, domain yeah. admins. They Someone a domain admin is the easy lazy button. Yeah. Right? So typically, yeah, like we've one, all done it. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, hey, my name's Patrick. I've made myself a domain admin to make it easy. Yeah. Right? You know, Ninety. Well I would say ninety percent of the time when I go into a company, I don't have domain admin rights. I usually have an OU level, or I have certain service accounts. I give them a list of I'm doing this product. This is what I need beforehand, and usually they have a list of accounts when I come in, and, and so forth. Or they have someone that can put in for certain areas to do that as well. So yep. um, that's one thing I always do as a practice. I never ask for domain admin accounts. Even they they just give it to you at the end, isn't it? Sometimes they do. Yeah. And that's, that, that's the lazy easy button. That's their easy button to you. Because mm -hmm. they want you to start your assessment. Well, yeah. to move yourself. Hey, <coughs> in a lot of customers, I don't even get such a keyboard. Yeah. Yeah, so there's sometimes yeah, yeah. too that I don't as well. I'm just over their shoulder telling what to do, so that, that's another thing. Yeah. So, so yeah, this these is a collection of all the people that, you know, Project VRC is probably so, there, um, and then all the. EUC champions and CTPs and CTAs out there that blog and put stuff out there. You know, that's how it's there. And then a couple of the references of some of the hardening guides from Microsoft. And all that is Microsoft and a lot of that is if you're looking at some of the NSS and stuff like that, like the government, a lot of those are built off those. So that is a good path to go down, right? Is it annoying? Terribly. Um, but is it worth it if you've got some very high value data and stuff like that? Of course. Yeah. You should do it um, because it needs to get done. That's all I got. Any questions?